Now a House hearing on the safety of ready-to-eat produce or produce that comes prepackaged at the store. You'll hear about efforts to prevent E. coli contamination in pre-bagged greens and other products. Among the witnesses, officials from the FDA and the Agriculture Department. Congressman Dennis Kucinich chairs this hour and 40-minute hearing. Committee will come to order. I'm Congressman Dennis Kucinich, Chair of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of Oversight and Government Reform. I'm joined uh, today by the ranking member of the subcommittee, uh, Mr. Jordan of Ohio. And uh, today's hearing will examine the safety of ready-to-eat produce, the successes and challenges posed by the California Leafy Greens Marketing Handling Agreement. And for the sake of this uh, hearing, we're going to use the acronym CALGMA. So when you hear CALGMA, it stands for California Leafy Greens Marketing Handling Agreement. And, and we're going to also be talking about uh, the proposed nationalization of that agreement. The hearing will focus on bagged or value-added leafy greens marketed as ready-to-eat. Consumers are quite familiar with those products. We're going to look at the role of private industry and government in regulating these products and the economic, environmental, and food safety impacts of that regulation. Now, without objection, the chair and the ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements uh, that of other members, not to exceed th three minutes by any member who seeks recognition. Without objection, members and witnesses have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. And without objection, the chairman and ranking member will each have 10 minutes for questions in the first round, after which we'll proceed under the five-minute rule. Pre-cut, packaged leafy greens marketed as ready-to-eat have become increasingly popular, capturing 70 percent of the leafy greens market. Americans appreciate the convenience of this partially processed product and are eating more fresh produce as a result. That's a good and important development and will likely help to improve the health of Americans. Yet, as the popularity of bagged lettuce and spinach has increased, so have rare but serious foodborne illnesses associated with it. Outbreaks of E. coli, 157, and other pathogens have occurred in relation to pre-cut packaged leafy greens at least once a year, practically every year since 2003. Regulation to prevent these outbreaks rests in the hands of the industry. The California Leafy Greens Handler Marketing Agreement, CALGMA, was implemented to stave off regulatory action by the State of California. CALGMA ensures adherence to a specified set of good agricultural practices designed primarily by the Food and Drug Administration to improve the safety of leafy greens. In spite of its name, CALGMA is having an impact on farmers in all parts of the nation due to the requirements of compliance with CALGMA imposed by national processing and retailing outlets which buy and market their produce. The USDA is currently proposing the creation of a national marketing agreement along the lines of CALGMA. There's much good in the CALGMA initiative. CALGMA embodies private industry's positive efforts to safeguard the American food supply. Handlers responsible for growers' compliance with food safety metrics pay for auditors trained by the USDA and hired by the CALGMA board to carry out surprise and scheduled inspections of standards adopted voluntarily by signatory farmers. CALGMA, however, 
has some blind spots as well. It condones a processing activity favored by the ready-to-eat processing industry known as coring, coring lettuce in the field, and only suggests minimal guidelines for sanitary treatment of harvest equipment used for coring, in spite of recent scientific research identifying the potential for transferring pathogens deep into the cored lettuce, where the subsequent washing process would be unable to reach. CALGMA is silent on the use of certain packaging of ready-to-eat produce known as modified atmosphere packaging, the bags of ready-to-eat greens. CALGMA does not require an enforceable standard of cold chain of distribution. It does not impose tough requirements on packagers and distributors relating to the best consumed by date that's stamped on the ready-to-eat packaging. People have seen those. So they don't have any tough requirements on those packagers and distributors. Put that stamp on there. Now, scientists tell us that if bagged produce labeled as ready-to-eat is not constantly refrigerated through the distribution chain, it quickly becomes a perfect habitat for bacterial growth. Harmful bacteria, such as E. coli 157, multiply unseen and undetectable to the eye of the consumer. Legions of pathogens can thereby invade the unsuspecting consumer's intestinal tract, overwhelming his or her immune system, causing severe and painful complications, and in some cases, death. Everyone who has experienced severe food poisoning knows what's at stake. While it's largely silent on key questions applying to upstream processing and distribution of ready-to-eat produce, CALGMA has a lot to say about farming practices and land stewardship. Small and organic farmers in particular have expressed concern about the costs and the scientific justification for some of CALGMA's requirements. Some of CALGMA's metrics are seen to be in direct conflict with environmental protection and widely accepted agricultural practices. In some cases, streams have been contaminated, wildlife refuge destroyed, biodiversity threatened by farmers' efforts to remain in compliance with CALGMA. Today, we hope to address why CALGMA's regulatory framework has focused solely on farming practices to the exclusion of the rest of the supply chain. It seems the farmers have taken the brunt of the burden of minimizing contamination when it may make more scientific sense to focus attention on the processing, packaging, and distribution of ready-to-eat produce. Consumers have a right to expect that the food they eat is safe. It's in the public health interest that Americans consume greater amounts of raw vegetables. But whether or not nationalizing CALGMA, as the USDA has proposed, is the best way to achieve those goals is a question of uh, this hearing. I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses today on this important issue. And at this time, I recognize the uh, Honorable Congressman Jordan ranking member of the committee from the state of Ohio. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I want to thank you for holding this hearing to examine the impact of the leafy green marketing agreements. Most importantly, we need to have food supply that is safe. Americans should be able to feel confident that the produce they buy at the grocery store or that is served to them at restaurants will not make them sick. Leafy green marketing agreements such as CALGMA may be a, an effective way to ensure safer produce. However, additional guidelines and regulations may be overly burdensome to some farmers, especially small or family-owned and run farms. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about their experience with uh, the marketing agreements. The FDA and USDA also play key roles in food safety and agriculture marketing. 
And I'm interested to hear how these roles may change if a, if a Leafy Greens marketing agreement is made national. Additionally, I hope that our witnesses can discuss the implications of H.R. 2749, Food Safety Enhancement Act of 2009, which is scheduled to be voted on uh, yesterday and, and, and may, in fact, be voted on later today. Um, so I look forward to hearing how uh, your, your thoughts on, on that legislation as well. And I also look forward to examining the pros and cons of making, a national, making national the CALGMA uh, 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 agreement and thank our witnesses for taking the time to testify here in front of the committee today. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. If there, uh, does the gentlelady from California have an opening statement? I do, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you so much for holding today's hearing to examine the leafy greens market, the role of private industry and government in regulating these products, and the economic, environmental, and food safety impacts of the California Leafy Greens Market Agreement. The hearing is happening at a very opportune time, and since 2003, um, pre-cut bagged lettuce has developed into the second fastest growth industry in the United States grocery sales. And you know, I'm from California. We believe in salads. And so making it critically important that adequate precautions are taken and analysis conducted to endure that this increasingly popular food is not just nutritious but safe. And we have taken steps, uh, Mr. Chairman, in the State of uh, California to regulate the sale of not only the leafy greens package but those in the bins as well. 98.5% uh, of the E. coli outbreaks reported in leafy greens have been associated with bagged and pre-cut greens. Now the infamous 2006 spinach outbreak resulted in over 200 hospitalizations, nearly $400 million in lost product, and three deaths confirmed by the FDA. In response to this and other similar instances, Industry leaders developed the California Leafy Greens Marketing Agreement <clears throat> to allow growers to join a voluntary regulatory framework which now encompasses 99 percent of California's leafy green business and is being considered for official nationalization. And I chaired those uh, committee meetings, Mr. Chairman, when I was uh, chairperson of Health and Human Services. The um, CALGMA Cal includes a food safety inspection program conducted by the USDA and the enforcement of metrics or regulations developed by scientists, governmental officials, growers, uh, processors, and businesses to reduce microbial contamination of leafy greens in the field to fork supply chain. While I am pleased that the farming industry has taken the initiative to create this comprehensive framework for food safety, I believe it is important to scrutinize its effectiveness and its impact on the environment. Some have argued that the rules placed on farmers by CalGAM conflict with the movement towards organic and biological diverse farming methods and could be actually harming the environment. Furthermore, it may prove to be uh, a counterintuitive to create such regulations before, that is, there is conclusive scientific knowledge about how E. coli makes its way into the leafy green supply. So I would like to thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to make this presentation. I am sorry I cannot stay. They just called an emergency meeting of the Progressive Caucus to discuss uh, the health care reform bill, and it is at 2.30. I just wanted you to know that. But I have staff here, and I will uh, be uh, hearing from them as to the witnesses in their testimony. So thank you so much. I yield back. I, I thank the gentlelady, and I am sure she will convey my sentiments in that uh, meeting of the Progressive Caucus. Uh, you can let them know that I am uh, given the responsibility of chairing this hearing. Thank you for being here with that opening statement. If there is no additional opening statements, the subcommittee will now receive testimony from the witnesses before us today. I want to start by introducing our first panel. 
Mr. Mr. Michael, Michael R. Taylor is the Senior Advisor to the Commissioner of Food and Drugs at the Food and Drug Administration. Mr. Taylor, welcome. Mr. Taylor previously served as Deputy Commissioner for Policy and is a member of the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Environmental Decision Making under an Uncertainty. He has held numerous positions in the field of food safety and research, among them Administrator of the Food Safety and Inspection Services at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Vice President for Public Policy at Monsanto Corporation. He's a, he was also a practicing attorney in the field at the law firm of King and Spaulding. Ms. Rain Pegg is the Administrator of the Agriculture Marketing Services, AMS, the marketing and regulatory arm of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Welcome, Ms. Pegg. Prior to being appointed Administrator at AMS, Ms. Pegg was Deputy Secretary of Legislation and Policy for the California Department of Food and Agriculture. She has also served as Director of International Trade and Plant Health for the California Farm Bureau, uh, Federation's National Affairs and Research Division, and as a Director of Governmental Relations to the Agricultural Council of California. Thanks for appearing before our subcommittee today. It is the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. So I would ask that you rise and uh, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. I ask that each of the witnesses now give a brief summary of their testimony. And to keep this summary under five minutes in duration, I want you to know that your entire statement and anything else you want to append to it will be included in the hearing record. Mr. Taylor, you will be our first witness. and. Uh, you may proceed. Five minutes. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Chairman Kucinich and uh, Mr. Jordan. I am Michael Taylor, Senior Advisor to the Commissioner at the Food and Drug Administration, which, as you know, is part of the Department of Health and Human Services. I am pleased to be with you today to discuss issues related to the safety of fresh produce. As you know, FDA is the Federal agency that is responsible for regulating most of the food supply except for meat, poultry, and processed egg products, which are overseen uh, by our partners at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. FDA is committed to ensuring that the U.S. food supply continues to be among the safest in the world. President Obama has made a personal commitment to improving food safety. On July 7, this year, the, the multi-agency food safety working group that the President established issued its key findings on how to upgrade the food safety system for the 21st century. The working group recommends a new public health focused approach to food safety based on three core principles, prioritizing prevention, strengthening surveillance and enforcement, and improving response and recovery. FDA has been an integral part of the working group's continuing efforts to establish uh, these principles. Fresh produce, the topic of today's hearing, presents special uh, safety challenges, as the Chairman outlined, and the number of illnesses associated with fresh produce is a continuing concern uh, for FDA. The increased consumption of produce in its fresh or raw form, including ready-to-eat bag products, reflects growing consumer interest in healthy eating, as you indicated, which is, of course, a desirable trend from a public health standpoint. But these new consumption patterns and products challenge our food safety efforts. Fresh produce has the potential to be a source of foodborne illness because it, it is consumed raw or with only minimal uh, processing and without, generally, interventions that would eliminate uh, any pathogens that may be present. Because most produce is grown in an outdoor environment, it is susceptible to contamination from pathogens present in the soil in manure used as fertilizer due to the presence of animals in or near fields or packing areas, or in agricultural water or water used for uh, washing or cooling. Produce also may be vulnerable to contamination due to inadequate worker health and hygiene protections, environmental conditions, inadequate production safeguards, or inadequate sanitation of equipment and facilities. Fresh produce is produced on tens of thousands of farms, and contamination at any one step in the growing, packing, and processing chain can be amplified throughout the subsequent steps. But we also know that the possibility of harmful contamination can be minimized 
By understanding these potential entry points for pathogens and by implementing preventive measures wherever possible throughout the system. Thus, in keeping with the Obama administration's prevention-oriented food safety strategy, FDA intends to improve safety uh, of fresh produce by establishing enforceable standards for the implementation of science-based preventive controls throughout the chain of production, processing, and distribution. These regulations will capitalize on what we in the produce industry have learned over the past decades since we published our Good Agricultural Practices Guidances uh, in 1998, and they will tap the best science to develop appropriate criteria or metrics for ensuring the, the effectiveness of preventive controls in particular, in particular production and processing settings. In the short term, FDA will issue commodity-specific guidances for industry on the measures they can implement now to prevent or minimize microbial hazards of, of fresh produce. FDA will soon uh, publish draft guidances for improving the safety of leafy greens, melons, and tomatoes three specific commodities that have been associated with foodborne illness outbreaks. The guidances describe preventive controls that industry can implement to reduce the risk of microbial contamination in the growing, harvesting, transporting, and distribution of these commodities. It is not enough, of course, to issue regulations and guidances. We must also ensure that the preventive measures they call for are widely and effectively implemented. To that end, FDA will work with its federal and state partners to plan and implement an inspection and enforcement program, program aimed at ensuring high rates of compliance with the produce safety regulations. FDA recognizes the importance of leveraging the expertise and resources of other federal, state, and local agencies to be sure the industry understands the new requirements and to help them achieve greater compliance. One way we can leverage resources is to work with the Agricultural Marketing Service as they consider and implement marketing agreements and orders. By incorporating FDA standards and voluntary marketing agreements and then conducting audits to ensure compliance by those who subscribe to such agreements, AMS contributes to the goal we all share, which is widespread compliance with modern preventive control measures. We believe that AMS, by incorporating FDA's produce safety standards and marketing agreements or orders, can help ensure high rates of compliance with FDA standards. In addition to highlighting measures that the executive branch could implement to enhance food safety, the White House Food Safety Working Group also noted the need for Congress to modernize the food safety statutes. Legislative authorities for FDA that would enhance the safety of products include enhanced ability to require science-based preventive controls, enhanced ability to establish and enforce performance standards to measure the implementation of proper food safety procedures, access to basic food safety records, a new inspection mandate, uh, and other tools to foster compliance and other provisions. The Food Safety Enhancement Act, H.R. 2749, being considered by the House today, it, it addresses these needs, and the, the Obama administration strongly supports its passage. Uh, thank you again for the chance to be here, Mr. Chairman. look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. Ms. Begg, you may proceed. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation for me to appear here before you today. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you a brief overview of our act activities regarding marketing orders and agreements for fruits and vegetables. As Mr. Taylor stated, FDA is the federal agency responsible for food safety of fruits and vegetables. At USDA, the Food Safety and Inspection Service holds similar responsibility for meat, poultry, and egg products. The mission of AMS is to facilitate the marketing of agricultural products. AMS is not a food safety agency. We are an agency with a long history of working with producers and processors on marketing programs that in involve inspection of product, product quality and verification production processes. Under the Agricultural Marketing Agreement Act of 1937, marketing orders and agreements assist farmers and handlers by allowing them to collectively work to solve marketing problems. These pro programs are industry initiated and subject to pub public review. There is a seven-step process in initiating a marketing agreement. The industry petitions yes, USDA, which recently occurred on the National Leafy Green Marketing Agreement. USDA, USDA holds public meetings, which we will be having on the National Leafy Greens Marketing Agreement in September and October. We review all comments and either terminate the proceedings or publish a proposed rule. In the past, we have terminated proceedings of a potential marketing agreement or order. USDA publishes a final agreement and appoints a committee. The committee develops best practices. Those best practices are sent out, are published for public comment, and then USDA publishes a final metrics or best practices. Marketing agreements only apply, 
apply to handlers who voluntarily sign an agreement. Fees are collected from handlers to cover local costs of administering these programs. The Act provides authority to regulate the quality of commodities through federal agreements. USDA considers the harmful pathogens of toxins to be a characteristic of higher quality products. Federal marketing orders and agreements include minimum quality grade requirements, which can identify with the presence of mold, insect infestation, foreign material, or other contaminants. The marketing order for California prunes has an inspection and fumigation requirements relative to live insect infestations since 1961. Since 1977, California raisins have required the absence of dirt, insects, and mold. And beginning in 2005, pistachio handlers were required to test all nuts destined for human consumption for aflatoxin, which, if present, if present, would be lower, would lower the quality and market value of pistachios. On June 8th, AMS received an industry proposal for a national marketing agreement for lettuce, spinach, spinach, and other leafy greens. The purpose of the proposed agreement is to enhance the quality and increase the marketability of fresh, leafy, green vegetable products through the application of good agricultural and handling practices. Requirements implemented under the proposed program would be science-based, conform to FDA guidance to minimize food safety risks, and be subject to USDA oversight. The program would only be binding on signatory handlers. The program would require signatories to verify that any product handled comes from producers or handlers using verified good agricultural and handling practices. The program would authorize unannounced audits and apply to imports. Any product deemed an immediate food safety risk concerned by USDA inspection would be reported to FDA. We are aware that there are concerns from various groups on the proposed marketing agreement. We welcome comments from those parties and other interested parties and will carefully consider them. To conclude, Mr. Chairman, I would like to reiterate that the federal food safety policies for fruits and vegetables fall under the jurisdiction of FDA. However, AMS does have significant experience in the design and delivery of marketing programs, including marketing orders and agreements. The process for potentially establishing a marketing order or agreement is an open and transparent process in which AMS carefully considers all viewpoints. I'm happy to respond to any questions. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, we will now proceed with 10 minutes of questions, uh, beginning with myself, and then I'll turn it over to Mr. Jordan. I'd like to start with Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor, ready to eat is a marketing slogan assuring that the salad in the package is safe for consumption without requiring further washing or cutting by the consumer. The California Leafy Greens Handler Marketing Agreement, CALGMA, is a voluntary industry-sponsored means of ensuring quality and safety of processed leafy greens, including those to be marketed as ready to eat. It was developed to preempt legislative regulatory action from the California State Assembly. Has CALGMA made pre-cut salads safer than they were before? And if yes, what's the basis for that opinion? Well, the, Mr. Chairman, the, the practices, uh, producer practices embodied in that agreement, if implemented, make a contribution to making the food safer. I think we all understand that the, the safety of the product ultimately depends on what happens not only at that point on the, on the production end, but through processing and the way the product is handled throughout. When you say contribution, what do you mean? Well, the, it, and is there sci what's the science behind that? The, the safety of, the, of these products at the end depends on preventing contamination. The, they're, Pull that mic a little closer, will you, sir? Sorry. Thanks. The, the, the safety of these products really depends uh, fundamentally on prevention of contamination in the first place. Uh, for a, a raw, uh, a fresh product, we don't have processing steps that decisively kill pathogens. So prevention throughout the system is the key to safety. And so the point is that the on-farm practices embodied in the agreement make a contribution. But, but isn't it true that uh, since Calgary went into effect, there's still been foodborne illnesses traced to the bag leafy lettuce produce? The, the, they're absolutely. They're the, the safety. Do you, do you remember some of them, the uh, Romaine, 2008 Romaine lettuce outbreak? Remember that? I, I was not in the government then, but I am aware of these outbreaks. You're aware of the iceberg yeah. lettuce outbreak also in that year? Yeah, I think. Well, isn't it true that in nearly every case since 1999, outbreaks of foodborne pathogens that were traced to leafy greens involved pre-cut packaged leafy greens, not whole leafy greens? Yeah. Mr. Taylor? 
Yeah, no, improving the safety of these products is a work in progress, Mr. Chairman. Let me just mention well, another wait, thing. You didn't answer my question, though. I mean, one of the things about being in, this, in front of this committee, it's a lot easier if you answer the question. You didn't answer the question. Please answer the question. If, if the question is whether the, the marketing agreement has solved the problem of fresh produce safety, no, the answer is no, of course it hasn't. Well, I, I, I asked you a question, though. You didn't answer. I'm going to repeat it just to make sure that you heard it. I asked you that isn't it true that in nearly every case since 1999, outbreaks of foodborne pathogens that were traced to leafy greens involved pre-cut packaged leafy greens, not whole leafy greens? Th yes or no? Yes. Thank you. Now, Mr. Taylor, doesn't that suggest that the processing of leafy greens is a significant factor, the processing is a significant factor in causing outbreaks of foodborne pathogens? There are features of that process that do create an environment for pathogen growth. You're Is that a yes or a no? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, according to the CEO of CALGMA, the FDA reviewed the good agricultural practices and metrics imposed by CALGMA, and the USDA insists that its marketing agreement program is consistent with FDA guidelines and regulations. One thing we've noticed in our review of CALGMA is that a lot of requirements are imposed on farmers, while comparatively less burdensome guidance is suggested to the processors who buy the greens from the farmers and turn them into pre-cut packaged salads for marketing to the public. I mean, even when I look at your testimony, it's, you know, you're still pretty heavy on the farmer side. Now, for instance, when CALGMA prohibits farmers from planting within 400 feet of a hedgerow on the questionable basis that wildlife pose a significant risk of contamination, CALGMA allows the processing activity of coring lettuce in the field, an activity that the FDA acknowledges has a potential for contamination, with only minimal guidance for washing and storing of the knives used to core lettuce. Seems to be a double standard, Mr. Taylor. Is CALGA's, CALGMA's imposition of detailed requirements on farmers, but only suggested guidelines on handlers and distributors, justified by the science on how to make pre-cut salads safer? The science says we need enforceable preventive measures throughout the system from farm through distribution. And that's why the Food and Drug Administration is going to issue regulations that would do exactly that. The science says that, but what about CALGMA's uh, requirements on farmers as opposed to uh, guidance on handlers and distributors? But you're saying then that there's a, there's a gap. Is that you saying that? There's a lot of work to do to improve the safety of produce. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. In fact, doesn't the FDA's 2008 guidance for industry to minimize microbi uh, microbial food safety hazards for fresh cut foods and vegetables incorporate specific standards for processing, packaging, and transportation of leafy greens that CALGMA does not? Isn't that true? Y yes. Okay. It, yes. We're making progress. Now, Ms. Gray. <laughs> yes. I can't you know how many, tell you how many times farmers, especially small farmers, have told me that the USDA represents everybody but the farmers. Mm -hmm. Let's hope the new administration succeeds in changing that impression. In the next panel, we're going to hear from a farmer who has a lot of criticism of CALGMA. And we're going to hear from a survival, uh, survivor of E. coli poisoning related to pre-cut lettuce that she ate in 2008. As you know, USDA is actively promoting the nationalization of CALGMA. What is the USDA's position on CALGMA's apparent double standard? in that it prescribes specific, if not always scientifically supportable, requirements on farmers, while it condones questionable processing protocols that benefit the processing companies, such as coring lettuce in the field. We do not have a position on the current National Leafy Greens marketing proposal. That's before the public. It's at the very beginning of the process. The hearings will begin in September and October. Think? What do I? What do you think? What do I think? What do you think? I think at the end of the day, the program needs to work for small producers. It needs to work for different cultural practices, regional differences. I think at the end of the day, that's the only way you're going to have the best national program. At the end of the day, do you think the processing companies ought to have uh, protocols that are protective of the consumers? I processors, yes, should. Everyone has to play a part in food safety in Including the chain. Including processors, not just the farmers, processors as well? Yes, of course. Okay. Now, Ms. Pegg, if CALGMA becomes nationalized, there will likely be increased costs on growers, farmers, as they take mitigation measures to be in compliance with the CALGMA requirements. 
These costs will be both financial as well as environmental, such as costs of turning areas of land that might have been previously wild into empty lots, and the associated land erosion, runoff, stream contamination that follows. With this in mind, do you believe that uh, the USDA should consider environmental impacts when promoting marketing agreements, regulating food production? Yes. We Thank must. You. We must consider environmental impacts. We must, we must make sure that it's in compliance with state and federal laws. I think the other point that, point that you bring up is right now what farmers are facing, and I just got an email last night from a farmer I know in California, is they're facing buyers are requiring good agricultural practices. And so even without the marketing agreement, you're seeing buyers demanding good agricultural practices of farmers. Let's talk about a specific issue that would matter to the processors as opposed to the farmers. Isn't it true that the best, that best consumed by expiration date that's stamped is now 15 to 17 days after the produce leaves the processing plant, while well, only seven years ago the best consumed by date for fresh cut produce was more like five to ten days? I actually have no knowledge of the best consumed date. I think that may be an FDA issue. So well, okay, you know, I let's go to Mr. Taylor then. Okay. Uh, <laughs> she she <laughs> deferred to you. Now, sorry, uh, did you get the, did you get the question? We're, we're our partners here, Mr. Chairman. I, I see that partnership. Now I want to find out well, how good of a partner you are. Can you answer the question? Yes, those best consumed dates are really a company. Uh, measure those aren't an FDA requirement, and they address uh, product quality. Okay, principally. well, you know they're company measures, but uh, isn't it true that the best consumed date that was that stamped yeah. right now it's about 15 to 17 days after the produce leaves the processing plant, right? Is that right yeah, or not? I, I, don't, I don't personally have those facts at my disposal, but I don't, have ha them. I don't have any reason. You're to the guy. You got to have them. Yeah. It's 15 to 17 days after the produce leaves the processing plant. But a few years ago, Mr. Jordan, the best consumed by date for fresh produce was more like five to ten days. Now, you know, and I'd, I would ask you, Mr. Taylor, to take note of that because wouldn't it show you that you're, you're making a, um, a, you're closing a window here yeah. a little bit on, on issues of safety? Yeah. You're opening up the possibilities of contamination, right. especially if these well, bag no, the, leafy greens uh, become hot houses of contamination if there's not consistent refrigeration. No, and this is where, uh, again, preventive controls, science-based preventive controls are all about understanding issues just like that. What, what is the, the likelihood of growth? What are the conditions that would reduce growth? And what's a, an acceptable holding period uh, for products? So in doing our preventive control regulations, that's the kind of issue that we'll need to address. Okay, one final question, and we're going to go over to um, uh, my colleague, Mr. Jordan. Uh, Ms. Pegg, mm -hmm. CALGMA is silent on the selection of best consumed by dates. It doesn't require processes to reverse the trend of longer and longer best consumed by dates. Isn't that right? I, I don't, I really don't know, you know okay, on that. And well, I don't the, know the what correct, the correct answer in this case was yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to go to Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank our witnesses again for uh, for being here. Let me just uh, pick up where the chairman was. Um, uh, Mr. Taylor, you, you said you didn't know the, the 15 to 17 days, and then uh, what what a few years ago was five to 10 days. Um, is, is that that you personally don't know, or is that something that the USDA does not track and does not have any knowledge of? Well, I'm, I'm with the Food and Drug Administration, I, and I, I definitely oh, FDA, excuse me. I, pers I don't personally know. I, I'm, I'm confident that our experts, uh, you know, technical experts, could, would have that information, and we can certainly share what knowledge we've got with you for sure. Okay, well, but but is it? Well, I guess, well, Ms. Pegg, is is that? Um, would you would you say that uh, the chairman's statement was was accurate? That's that's in fact been what's happened over the last several years. That that, that date has went from five to ten to fifteen to seventeen. You know, I, I remember a lot of discussion about this in 2006 when the outbreak occurred, but I, I don't know what the guidance is or uh, where the trends have gone. So we're I don't have any information on that right now. Okay. Uh, let me ask you. We're, we're going to have votes here in a few minutes, and one of the bills we're going to be voting on is Mr. Dingell's. 
uh, legislation, at least it looks like that. Um, give me your thoughts on that piece of legislation, because I know many in the agriculture community are concerned about that. Ms. Pegg, I think you, in your, in your introduction, uh, at least to the chairman, have a background with uh, mm -hmm. the California Farm Bureau. So let's start with you. Your thoughts on that bill that looks like it's going to be on the floor um, here in just a few minutes. Well, the bill clearly we support. Um, we do support the bill and we, we look for um, looking at what the working group produces and looking at other, as they review current statutes mm -hmm. and regulatory authorities and seeing how we can move into the 21st century. I think what many of these measures. Let me ask you specifically about some of the concerns we've, mm -hmm. we've heard from uh, folks in agriculture. I got a long email last yeah. night. <laughs> um, and in particular, uh, your former employer, the, the Farm Bureau, do you, think, uh, do you think they're way off base or do you think they, you know, again, recognizing where, where you uh, worked before, do you think they got some valid, valid concerns? You know, I, I think that we have to, I think in working with FDA and USDA, we have a good partnership where we can both educate one another about what happens in the field and they can assist us in giving us guidance on food safety practices. So I think it's a good partnership. That's why I personally am not, um, um, do not necessarily share the concerns of my former employers. Mr. Taylor, would you like to comment on that bill? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the core strength of this bill is that it would um, have Congress mandate uh, the shift to a prevention strategy and empower FDA to set and enforce standards for preventive controls that will make food safer throughout the system. Uh, for produce, it would, of course, direct FDA to issue regulations uh, to establish enforceable preventive controls and, importantly, direct FDA to take into account the diversity of the grower community, to take into account environmental impacts. I mean, these are all factors that have to be considered in order to get it right in terms of, of you know, having an abundant, safe supply of fresh produce, which is an important goal uh, that, that we all share. With respect to the, the concerns of the agriculture community, I mean, we've looked at the bill really hard. I think the bill has evolved a lot and, in fact, now very much focuses FDA's authorities with respect to on-farm activity to those areas such as fresh produce where there is going to be a, a science-based or sort of risk-based justification uh, for establishing standards. And so I think it's a fairly focused bill Let me in ask terms just a of practical its impact on the, 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 the family out there who this time of year sets up the sweet corn stand, um, makes, you know, makes a few extra dollars for yeah. their family. T tell me the impact, the legislation on the floor today or what we're talking about here in this hearing. Tell, tell me how Tell me how they, they might be impacted. Yeah. Well, it, it, in developing regulations like this for an industry that has that degree of diversity. And, and, and in my background, I yeah. remember dealing with this back at the State House. I yeah. mean, and it, it was an uproar when there were some, some changes in, in the State of Ohio on how we were going to address um, truck farms or whatever the, the official title right. were, they're given in the Ohio Revised Code. And we heard from mom and pop yeah. produce uh, 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 businesses all over the, uh, all over the yeah. state. So. Give yeah, me so, so business our, our activities like that, I mean, are, it's very hard to envision how a federal regulation could establish a meaningful preventive control regime for an operation like that. And so, again, taking the command of the bill seriously, we would look at where are the appropriate exemptions, how do you put the boundaries around these requirements so that we achieve the food safety objective, but also do it in a feasible, realistic way. I mean, that's, that's the command we hope we get from Congress, and we plan to do that. Ms. Peg? Well, I think he does bring up a lot that you have to take into, consider, into consideration what happens on uh, different scales. And I think we'll be working a lot with FDA on the implementation of it and providing our experience and our guidance up there in that area. So. Okay. Absolutely. Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions. Thank you. I'm going to uh, <clears throat> go to a uh, second round of questions and uh, it should be a little bit shorter. We'll go to the next panel. Mr. Taylor, uh, if you stretch out that best consumed by date on ready to eat pro uh, produce, it's a benefit for the processor. It obviously facilitates long distance transportation. Right. You know, instead of five to ten days, fifteen to seventeen days. Best used by. 
But isn't a shorter best consumed by period in the interest of protecting the public's health? Mr. Taylor. Well, uh, again, the, the question is uh, what, what are the holding conditions for that product? What's the nature of the product? And I think you, you've got to have a scientific answer to that question. And there's no question that if you have pathogen growth potential and you're not having cold chain sort of safe handling practices, then you, the longer you hold the, the product, the, the greater the risk. And so I think we need a science-based answer to what, what's right there. Well, let's look at, let's look at a science-based case. In the case of the 2006 E. coli 157 outbreak that affected at least 204 people, has the FDA correlated the location and date of the consumption of the tainted spinach and the date of illness with the date of harvesting? Yeah. Okay. Harvested, best used by 204 people with E. coli. You've done the correlations? Again, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I started four weeks ago. I can find out what investigation was done, and we can brief you on and give you an answer later. Well, well let me, okay, well then, since you don't know the it's answer, you started four weeks ago, and lovely to have you here. <laughs> Will the FDA submit in writing to this committee for inclusion in the record a spreadsheet with that information for each of the known victims of E. coli 157 poisoning, namely, the location and date of consumption of the tainted products, the date of illness, and the original date of processing. Can you do that? We will provide you the information we have and we'll... Uh, if, you we'll could, if you could do that, uh, we'd really appreciate that. And, and as a matter of fact, while we're at it, can you do that for all produce-related outbreaks since 1999? You know which ones they are. We've talked about a few of them. Yeah. Just create a spreadsheet. Shouldn't take too long to do, since you already have the information. Put it in a usable form for this committee so that we can, uh, it can help us in our deliberations about this issue of the transportation time and the best use by date, which so many consumers use as guidelines as to whether or not to consume something. Uh, for the uh, one, uh, Final question for each of the witnesses. Mr. Taylor again. Given CALGMA's purpose to protect public health by, redu health by reducing uh, microbial contamination in leafy greens, quote, from field to fork distribution supply chain, unquote, wouldn't it be more consistent with the purpose of CALGMA to include science-based restrictions on the packaging, distribution, and marketing practices of ready-to-eat produce rather than CALGMA's current near silence or lack of specific requirements on those issues? Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I can't speak to the scope of, of the permissible scope of marketing agreements at USDA, but the answer to whether we need standards at each of those stages along the way that are enforceable and set by the Food and Drug Administration, the answer is clearly yes. Science-based. Yes, sir. And I, Ms. Just, just to differentiate, too, the California marketing agreement is based on the California Marketing Act. We're looking at a national program, and I think that through this process as well as the public process, we can ensure that a final program does include all those components. Well, I, I want to, uh, before we conclude this, I'd like to uh, go back to Mr. Taylor. I want to read you a few opinions about the effect of the packaging used to market ready-to-eat produce. This is a quote. Because of the higher relative humidity of ready-to-eat packages, the risk of pathogenic growth is higher. Each degree over 40 degrees will increase the rate of pathogenic growth. This is from uh, Larry Boucher, PhD, Center for Food Safety, University of Georgia. Here's another quote. The problem comes when leafy greens are coming home in ready-to-eat bags. If they're left anywhere, when temperatures are above 50 degrees Fahrenheit, it's widely known they can become breeding grounds for bacteria, unquote. Uh, Mr. R. Atwell, Ph.D., Western Institute for Food Safety and Security. Uh, another quote. It's a perfect environment for all kinds of things to grow, unquote. 
Elisa Odabashian, West Coast Director, Consumer Union, Publisher of Consumer Reports. Mr. Taylor, isn't it true that all confirmed incidents of E. coli outbreaks since uh, 157 outbreaks since 1999 uh, have been caused by pre-cut packaged greens? As far as I know, and the only qualification is because I am under oath and just don't want to uh, misstate. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Jordan. Do you want to take five minutes? Yes, I'll, I'll be brief. Just take a quick question on the uh, on the bill again. That's going to be on the floor here in a few minutes. Um, the, the, according to what we've looked at in the bill, uh, this gives the FDA pretty broad authority to regulate how crops are raised. I mean, in, in, in effect, and I'll be anxious to hear. I know we have a, a farmer on the um, on the next panel. Uh, in, in effect, dictating how farmers produce their crop is is that your understanding of how the, the legislation is going to work? There's no sort of broad uh, authority for FDA to tell farmers how to grow their crops. There's very specific authority that if we, we, based on science, can identify a commodity that poses risks that can be addressed through preventive uh, control measures, uh, such as the industry itself is, is, is implementing, then we are empowered in that specific case to establish enforceable standards. But it's not a broad uh, preventive control think, mandate. Think, it seems to me, though, as, as the chairman's went to great lengths to point out, and I think appropriately so, that the problem doesn't see, seem to be with the farmer producing the crop. It seems to be elsewhere in the in the supply well, chain, yeah. elsewhere in the processing or transportation or, or what have you. Um, not with, uh, you, you know, that, that's my concern. Is that the, the, the farmer knows how to produce his crop. Let's let's not overregulate, overburden this guy who's who's producing the food. Yeah. Let's certainly not go out there and and make it difficult for the mom and uh, mom and pop who are. Uh, setting up the wagon and, and selling right. sweet corn to the neighbors and to the, to the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, but we just know how government works. I mean, look, uh, we were told uh, last year that we're going to just have one small little bailout. We promise it will just be one little bailout. Uh, and this thing won't grow. And, and you know, we, we don't want to get in the private sector. Like, and what we've seen what's happened over the last year just in the, in the financial industry alone, let, and let alone the auto industry. So. These always start out with great intentions, but we know the pattern of government and what, what typically happens. So uh, that's my concern. I think, frankly, it's in, in large degree the chairman's concern. And certainly, lots of folks in agriculture, their concern, because they just know the nature of government. Uh, it's, it's tough enough many times for folks in agriculture to deal with the State Department of Agriculture and other regulatory agencies at the state level, let alone now Big Brother in, in, in Washington uh, tell them how to run their farm, how to run their business. So that's my big concern, and um, we'll continue to watch this whole process relative to the bill and, and the issue we're, we're addressing here in the committee. And with that, I would yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. We're going to go to one, uh, one more round here uh, before we get to the next panel. Uh, Ms. Pegg, here's another example of something farmers have a problem with. CALGMA identifies a number of sources of potential pathogens that must be avoided for certification. These include birds, feral pigs, and other wildlife, as well as cattle. To comply, farmers are paying for measures, such as the building of large fences to thwart wildlife. But the science hardly concludes it, Ms. Pegg. The wildlife was a likely source of contamination. Uh, let me go over that again. The science is hardly conclusive. That wildlife was mm -hmm. a likely source of contamination in the 2006 spinach contamination. Isn't that so? Well, in the 2006, actually in the outbreak, there was, and maybe FDA can speak to this, but there was concern about wildlife in that outbreak that did occur. Um, yeah. Wild pigs was, was the wildlife in question. Are you saying, are you saying there was concern? Now, is that evidence-based? Is it, uh, or is it conjectural? What, what's the basis of that concern? And was it conclusive, or was it conjectural, or was it, was it science-based? What was it? Um, I d well, maybe you can speak to the investigation, but I d if you've been to the Salinas Valley and that region. I've been to Salinas Valley. Okay. There is um, that area, there is known some wildlife activity. Now, the California Leafy Greens Marketing Agreement does look at other potential risks, and they also do rank wildlife as high risk or low risk. I would like to, I, I would, in order to facilitate this hearing, I'd, I'd like you to supply to this committee the information 
about the, ba the basis of your statement uh, that wildlife was somehow connected with this. I'd like to see some scientific uh, backup of that, okay? Would okay, you, I thanks. will get it for the, now for the 2006. Two, right, exactly. Now, outbreak. Um, a leafy greens, Ms. Pegg, a leafy green field's proximity to cattle is a high risk circumstance for E. coli contamination. Does CALGMA make distinctions between high risk circumstances and lower risk circumstances such as the presence of frogs or other wildlife? Does CALGMA prioritize, in other words, high risk circumstances while deprioritizing low risk circumstances? I believe it does. And isn't it true that all farms have to eliminate r riparian areas, hedgerows, if they're within a CALGMA specified distance from a crop edge? I'm not, I'm not positive. On okay. the current Ms. Pegg, I want you to look that. at this slide on the screen. And staff put the slide up. Okay. The aerial photo above was taken before Calgma. You can plainly see a strip of green between several fields where trees and hedges are and where birds and wildlife can take shelter. Now look at the aerial photo below taken after Calgma. Here you can plainly see that the strip of trees and hedges has been eliminated. No wildlife there. Now, isn't it true, Ms. Pegg, that CALGMA would have required the cutting down of those trees? I, I don't know if I can speak to that because I don't know if they're CALGMA okay, participants or if they're buyers, which has been one of, I mean, this has been a huge issue. We have discussed this since, since 2006, is that how do you deal with, um, are there real risks or not? And I was talking to California Fish and Game this week about it. It's, well, it's well, a big you're, issue. You're the nation's advocate for farmers. Does it make sense for the USDA to advocate for a processor-based framework that requires all farmers to spend heavily to prevent low-risk events such as contamination by wildlife, while the higher risk but rarer circumstance of proximity to cattle and the known risk associated with processing and packaging leafy grains are more significant contributors to the problems CALGMA intends to address? Any program needs to address the risks and look at high risks versus low risks. I think what we're, we're looking at in terms of any program is looking at all chains in the process and how to reduce the risks. So who should pay for compliance with CALGMA? The farmer? The processing industry? Should the cost be shared? Under the marketing agreement, I believe they propose a per carton assessment that the handler pays to cover the cost of the marketing agreement. So who currently pays for the measures adopted to comply with CALGMA? I think for the California Leafy Green marketing agreement, that's a per carton assessment that pays for it. Farmers? Uh, well, they're handler signatories, so handlers pay it. Farmers. Okay, I think we're... Uh, I think we're completed with questioning of the first panel. Thanks. We will be in touch with you regarding the follow-up on questions that we've asked, and we appreciate your cooperation with the committee and your presence here today. Those buzzers that you heard are um, the reason why I'm going to have to recess this meeting until after votes. How many votes do we have? Uh, there are three votes, and so I'd like to take a, a half-hour break, and then we're going to come back for the second panel, and we'll take testimony from uh, those who are here to talk about their experience. I want to thank the uh, representatives of the FDA and the USDA for being here. Uh, we look forward to working with you on these issues so that we can help uh, the consumers across America have uh, co more confidence in the safety of our uh, leafy green packaged foods. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. And, Chairman. Uh, the committee stands in recess for a half hour. Going to vote. Be back uh, in about a half hour. Uh, before, before we begin, I, I just want to uh, 
uh, acknowledge the work of uh, our staff on both sides who have uh, helped with this hearing. Uh, we appreciate your work and to uh, uh, make it known that uh, we have one of our staffers, Charity, who has done a lot of work on this. Uh, she uh, could not be here today because of, a, uh, of an illness. We look forward to her return, but she did a lot of great research, and I just want uh, to acknowledge that uh, for the record, actually. So uh, thank you. And we're going to go to our second panel of witnesses, and I would like to introduce them. We'll start with Ms. Kelly Cobb. Welcome, Ms. Cobb. Uh, Kelly Cobb is a survivor of E. coli poisoning and has come here today to share her story with us. Her husband, Matt Cobb, serves in the United States Marines and they're parents of two young children. Uh, Mr. Scott Horsfall, did I pronounce that right? Is the Chief Executive Officer of the California Leafy Greens Marketing Board. Mr. Horsfall has served as Chairman of the United States Agricultural Export Development Council, was a member of the Agricultural Trade Advisory Committee for Fruits and Vegetables, and is past chairman of the Produce Marketing Association's International Trade Conference. Mr. Dale Koch. Welcome, Mr. Horsfall. Mr. Koch, welcome. Uh, Mr. Koch is a farmer and a member of the Community Alliance with Family Farmers. Mr. Koch is also the founder and president of Koch Farm, a produce cooling, storage, and shipping company located in San Juan Batista, California, which represents local California organic growers and selling throughout the U.S. and Canada. He's also a partner in, Jard in Jardines, a diversified organic farming operation growing on approximately 500 acres in Monterey and San Benito, California counties. The sixth generation of his family born in California to work in agriculture, he pioneered spring mix lettuce and was instrumental in developing its market. Ms. Caroline Smith Duval, is that the right pronunciation? Uh, welcome. Ms. Duval is the Director of Food Science at the Center for Science in the Public Interest, where she is a leading consumer analyst on reform of laws and regulations governing food safety. Since 1999, she's maintained and annually published a list of foodborne illness outbreaks organized by Food Source that now contain over 15 years of outbreak reports and is presented at numerous conferences. She's the co-author of the book, Is Our Food Safe? A Consumer's Guide to Protecting Your Health and the Environment and has authored numerous papers on food safety. I want to thank uh, the witnesses for their presence here today. It's the policy of our committee on oversight and government reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that you rise, raise uh, the right hand. You solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Let the record reflect that. Each of the witness, witnesses have answered in the affirmative. As with panel one, I ask that each witness give an oral summary of his or her testimony. I'd uh, like to see you keep that summary, maximum five minutes in duration. Any testimony that you want to add beyond that, your entire statement will be in the record. Anything you want to send to this committee within a few days, we'll get that in the record as well. Your complete written statement will be in the record. Uh, Ms. Cobb, welcome. I'd like you to uh, be our fir first witness. And would you please begin? And I would, uh, before you start, just pull that microphone a little bit closer because we want to make sure we hear everything you say. Thank you. There you go. In May 2008, I was busy as a stay-at-home mom to my two children, Liberty, who was three, and Matthew, who was one at the time. We were in Washington visiting um, family from California. Matt was. No, I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to interrupt you. I'm going to ask staff to take the responsibility of making sure that the microphone is close enough so that the witnesses can be heard. And frankly, I don't want to have to bring that up in a hearing again. It's directional, so you have to talk right into it. Sorry. 
Do you want me to start over? And just please speak. Uh, you have a very soft voice, and, but we, it's really important that we need to hear what you're saying. So why don't you begin at the top? Okay. In May 2008, I was busy as a stay-at-home mom raising my two children, Liberty, who was three, and Matthew, one. We were visiting family in Washington from California. We were there without my husband because he was serving as a Marine in Iraq for the second time. On May 10th, my mom invited me to go to a banquet dinner with her and some of her friends. Little did I know by accepting her invitation, I would be changing my life forever. That night, um, I ate a salad that was contaminated with E. coli. My mom, my children, and her friends that were there with us um, happened to sit at the same table. I just happened to pick the seat that was contaminated. Um, my children were there with us. My son was on my lap, but luckily he didn't eat greens at the time. On May 10th, I was getting ready for our drive back to California. I went to bed that night with a stomach ache and woke up um, on May 16th with uh, diarrhea and the most painful stomach cramps that occurred every 10 minutes until my, stern, my stool turned to blood at about 5 o'clock. I then proceeded to go to the ER where they just said that I had a bacterial infection. Um, I went home and was unable to hold down water, the medicine that they gave me, and I returned to the hospital. Two days later, I was told that I had the E. coli and that was the, pain, that was the cause of the illness, that it wasn't the bacterial infection. Well, it was bacteria, but not what they thought. I was discharged from the hospital only to return a couple days later because I developed a condition um, of HUS and was told at that time that my kidneys were only functioning at 50%. I was then started on plasma phoresis where um, they cycled out my blood and put in the, the new stuff. Um, over the time that I was in the hospital, I had over 50 blood draws, two ultrasounds, a CAT scan, um, a colonoscopy, seven IVs, a central line in my neck, and four units of whole blood, and 80 units of plasma. Both my husband and my father were in Iraq at the time. I had to send a Red Cross to um, my husband to let him know that what was going on. He was unable to come home. I had the kids. Um, I was the only caretaker with him being gone. So my mom took over that responsibility and set up child care for them while she was at work. They came to see me at the hospital every day and they didn't understand why I wasn't able to go home with them, why they couldn't stay with me. Um, they were so young that they, don't, they didn't understand what was going on. Um, there were several times that I didn't think I was gonna make it because of how sick I was. I remember on one day, um, I think it was the 28th, I had an allergic reaction to some pain medication that they, I was given, and I got intense chest pain. And um, I remember blacking out and not really knowing what was going on. And I honestly thought I was gonna die right there, the hospital bed. My husband was in Iraq, my father was in Iraq, the kids were at home, and that I wouldn't be there with them anymore. Um, and with that, I was able to really focus on what the nurses were telling me. Um, and they gave me another medication to help with the, the reaction. Um, from that incident, from the E. coli, I no longer eat any produce that I can't see being washed myself. I have gone to restaurants and asked them how they prepare their salads. Um, I cut everything, f or I clean everything from a bag of lettuce to a watermelon, because when you cut through it, it's gonna hit your, you know, your fruit. Um, the time I have with my family means so much more to me now, because I know that at any time it can be taken away from you. I, I was, I'm honestly surprised with how sick I got that I'm, I'm here today. Um, if anything, I would want the parties that at fault in my particular case to know that, you know, they took me away from my kids for two weeks and that's a time that they'll never get back. My son was one, that's, you know, he developed every day that I was gone. He came to the hospital saying new words every day, doing new things and I felt the pain that no, I can't, I can't describe to you the pain that I was in because I don't have a comparison that I could give to you. I would rather, you know, I said I'd rather break bones than go to that, you know. I would rather have a broken arm right now than go through the pain that I felt in E. coli because 
I don't have a comparison to actually give to you on what I felt. And, um, you know, it could be their family. It could have just as been easily been one of my, my kids. And had it been, I, it would have been devastating to them what I went, went through. Thank, thank you very much for coming here to testify. Uh, we're certainly going to be having some questions of you when we uh, go to that phase of this hearing. Uh, at this point, I'd like to ask Mr. Horsfall to uh, proceed for five minutes. Thank you uh, very much. Well, before you proceed, I want to welcome some of our visitors here from uh, China and Macau. Thank you for being here. So please proceed. Uh, thank you, uh, and good afternoon, uh, Chairman Kucinich and Ranking Member Jordan. Um, it, I, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I am always happy to talk about our program. I'll get to my statement. I, I would express to Ms. Cobb that what she went through does not fall on deaf ears in our industry. Um, uh, shortly after I started this job, uh, the, the USA Today ran a recap. It was a year after the, uh, the original outbreak. And they presented the stories of the, the, the four or five people who had died because they ate spinach. And, uh, you know, I, I, I know because I work with this industry that they, that they take that to heart. Um, they are trying to do everything they can do so that there aren't more victims, uh, so that we can reduce that risk as much as possible. Um, so I, I, I've used part of my time, but, but uh, the, the Leafy Greens Marketing Agreement was established in 2007. It is a mechanism, quite simply, for verifying through mandatory government audits that farmers of leafy greens follow a rigorous set of food safety standards. Uh, we are an instrumentality of the state of California, and we operate with oversight from the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Um, in the, uh, although the leafy greens industry had always prioritized food safety, in the aftermath of that outbreak in 2006, farmers and shippers and processors recognized that more effort was needed to protect public health. Uh, the question was how to do it. And, a lot of different approaches were looked at, including regulation at both the state and national level, uh, marketing orders, uh, and, and a marketing agreement. And the decision was ultimately made to, to, to go with the tool that was most readily available, which was a marketing agreement. Um, it is a voluntary organization, but it does have the, the, the force of government behind it. Uh, our members, when they do join, it is mandatory that they follow the, uh, the, the rules of the program. Um, and, and the, the idea was to, to use this marketing agreement. It also has the flexibility to change and amend the program as we get new research. And as you've talked about research a lot already this morning, and we are keenly interested in research that's being done so that we can make the program better. That flexibility is actually one of the key benefits of the, of the LGMA structure. Um, our program is focused on prevention, on preventing the introduction of pathogens into leafy greens fields and farms. Uh, we applaud the Obama administration and the President's Food Safety Working Group for their focus on prevention and their approach to improving food safety. Uh, on July 7th in their press conference, we're happy to hear Vice President Biden and Health and Human Services Secretary Sebelius talk about prevention as job number one. Um, I was asked to talk about where our metrics came from. As the LGMA was being developed, there was a parallel effort to create a set of food safety practices and standards. Um, sometimes referred to as good ag practices or metrics. Uh, they were developed by university and industry scientists as well as other food safety experts, uh, farmers and shippers. Uh, those standards were reviewed by FDA and the USDA and other state and federal health agencies. Um, they cover the major risk areas that have been identified by FDA and other food safety experts. Practices include careful attention to site selection for growing fields based on farm history and proximity to animal operations, appropriate standards for irrigation, uh, water and other sources of water, prohibition of raw manure uh, and the use of only cert certified safe fertilizers, and of course good employee hygiene in fields and, and harvesting. Um, the uh, our members are subject to mandatory audits by the California Department of Food and Agriculture to ensure that they are in compliance with the program. Uh, those auditors are uh, USDA trained, and the process that we use is a USDA certified uh, audit process. 
Uh, our members face penalties if they are not in compliance uh, up to and including decertification from the program, which can lead to serious uh, significant uh, economic repercussions for the company. Uh, from July 23rd of 2007, when we first began our auditing, uh, we have done over 1,000 government audits of our members. Um, and those continue today even as we speak. Uh, we all know that maintaining food safety vigilance is crucial to the future of the produce industry. Uh, and while there is still very much to do and we're not done, uh, I believe that the, the leafy greens industry is doing more to provide a safe, wholesome, delicious product now than they ever have before. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Horsfall. Mr. Koch, you may proceed for five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Kucinich and Ranking Member Jordan. Thank you for inviting me to here, here today. Um, I've been asked to address the impacts of California leafy green metrics on farming practices. Uh, for growers in California, it's estimated that the uh, economic impacts are on the order of about $18,000 per year on average per farm. It would be higher for larger farms and possibly less for smaller farms. Growers have to, um, of course, do testing of water, fertilizer, soil amendments, um, and anything else that goes on to the crop. They have to document uh, all of this. They have to be aware of animal incursions, um, pay attention to uh, vegetation, um, and then also provide some kind of traceability. Uh, traceability is not such an issue for grower like our, ourselves, uh, um, organic growers have had to do, uh, be able to trace product for years. Uh, there's also been prohibitions against manure use for organic uh, production for years and compost. Uh, there's no sewage sludge or other kinds of toxic chemicals you use. But organic growers are facing uh, significant issues with the push for uh, the regulators to have uh, to ban you know wildlife and and non-crop vegetation things like windbreaks and habitat uh, which are things that are supposed to be encouraged by organic laws that pertain to maintaining your certification the um, environmental impacts often vary uh, depending on the inspector and his interpretation of uh, the metrics. There are certain companies that use their own metrics, which are called super metrics in the industry. Um, wildlife, non crop vegetation, and water bodies are normally viewed as food safety risks. A lot of environmentally positive uh, projects have been abandoned uh, or by growers who have been threatened with the uh, loss of the ability to uh, sell their crops. Windbreaks. Uh, vegetated filter strips, tailwater reuse reservoirs, grass roadways, vegetated ditches have been removed to comply with, you know, the inspectors that come out to, to check on the, on the crop. Many fields have deer and pig fencing, but some also have frog and rodent fencing, um, even though those haven't been found to be a vector of pathogens. Some of the fields for leafy greens use uh, traps, poison traps for rodents, um, secondary poisoning of raptors and owls can occur with this. Um, and a lot of these practices are more based on the processors uh, having problems pulling them out of the harvested crop because of the nature of the harvest of the crop than it is, has to do with being a food safety issue. Um, Practically, this has been a big step backwards for environmental protection. It was just starting to move forward on farms. Um, there's a lot bit more money and time that farmers have to spend trying to comply with these metrics and document this. Uh, the majority of the disease-related outbreaks, food disease-related outbreaks that are associated with leafy greens um, come from pre-cut processed products. Um, there's some kind of failure during that process to make it ready to eat and, or to keep, make it clean enough so you don't have the pathogens. Uh, salad processors tend to point to the fields as being the issue. 
Um, it's very difficult for farmers to grow in a sterile crop in, a, in an open field. Um, you do have, you know, we have always had employee hygiene. We're concerned about our compost and we don't use manure. We test our water and our fertilizer as many farmers do just to make sure that you're not part of the problem. Um, now, leafy green farmers are now in the unenviable position of uh, having to pay for and comply with a roster of unproven safety metrics and attempted to, attempting to grow pathogen-free crops and um, being held potentially liable for it. Uh, the California Leafy Green Marketing Agreement um, has made steps in the right direction, I think, for the processed uh, product that it should be representing. Um, I don't know that marketing agreements are an appropriate way to provide food safety, whether they be a state or national. They are, in my mind, there are something that uh, focuses on marketing product rather than on actual, you know, conditions of growing product. Uh, this being said, um, if this were to be moved in that direction if the focus on was just on processed food you would reduce a lot of impact on there are a lot of farmers that don't grow leafy greens that go into um, into bags and uh, they would be ex you know if the focus was just on the processed arena you could exempt them right now the and I was there when they started having the meetings to decide about leafy greens in California they included specific vegetables, and I asked why those, why they were inc just including a few vegetables. There was no answer because they, they didn't differentiate whether it was uh, a whole head or a bunch product. It was just we're going to include these vegetables, and the only reason I can come up with is that it's uh, something to enhance their competitive edge because it gives them a marketing advantage if you need to adhere to these metrics and you kind of raise the bar. A lot of farmers w might not be able to make that. I, uh, I want to thank uh, the gentleman for his testimony. Your entire statement will be included in the record. Okay. And as someone who's been so involved in the development of, of uh, this industry, we appreciate okay. your presence here. Uh, chair recognizes Ms. Smith DeWall for five minutes. And after your testimony, we're going to uh, go to a round of questions of the uh, panel. You Thank may proceed. You. Thank you very much, Chairman Kucinich, and also uh, Representative Jordan. Uh, my name is Caroline Smith Dewell. I direct the Food Safety Project for the Center for Science in the Public Interest. CSPI has concerns about the increasing use of marketing orders as a vehicle for regulating safety. Fifteen different agencies administer 30 different laws that regulate food safety in the U.S. today, and marketing orders really represent a further fractioning of this already uh, widely fractured system. Foodborne illness outbreaks linked to fresh produce are among uh, the major public health problems when it comes to food safety. And leafy greens and salads are among the top food categories, along with beef, poultry, and seafood, that cause both outbreaks and illnesses. In addition, the average size of outbreaks linked to produce tends to be larger, so they tend to affect more people. The importance of robust and reliable food safety practices on the farm cannot be understated. Leafy greens, once contaminated, can support, grow, and spread pathogens until they are consumed. Chlorination and other post-harvest controls can help reduce cross-contamination between different lots of salad, for example, but they don't make contaminated product, product that comes in from the farm contaminated, truly safe to eat. In fact, scientists have shown how bacteria can inhabit the washing systems used for bag lettuce and transfer bacteria from a contaminated lot really onto a full day's production of leafy greens of salads. 
While FDA has jurisdiction over on-farm food safety, it really has not acted as an infect effective regulator. And they've been using for at least the past 10 to 15 years the, the concept of guidance, unenforceable guidance to the industry instead of regulations. But the absence of, of enforceable rules leaves a significant hole in the fabric of food safety, allowing and even encouraging the industry to weave standards of its own design. The Agricultural Marketing Service has served as a friendly regulator of choice when food safety problems arise. At AMS, the food industry can draft their own rules called marketing orders or agreements to best suit their needs. But AMS is not equipped to monitor the safety of food. The primary focus of AMS is with the pr promotion of food products. And the mechanisms that it uses are limited in terms of their geographic scope and, and often they're completely voluntary. These are voluntary systems and farmers have to agree and the handlers have to agree to comply. So they're limited to U.S. companies. Sometimes they're limited to companies just in the state of California. And this is particularly troubling when you consider that uh, consumers, 13 uh, percent of our diet is from imported produce. So a huge amount of produce is never going to be subject to these marketing orders. AMS oversees marketing orders for 22 different commodities, including things like almonds and shell eggs. And these programs can really instill a false sense of security, both for the industries involved and for consumers, because they really are quality programs. They're not based on safety. But given the absence of rulemaking at FDA, it's not really surprising that in the aftermath of the 2006 spinach outbreak, the leafy green industry turned to AMS to create these stronger rules. I just want to note that the, these standards really do create uncertainty. And they give rise to the private standards, which are actually the complaint of many of the growers today. The growers today are saying these private, these standards are too burdensome. But let me cl be clear, these aren't mandatory standards. They're not FDA standards. They don't apply to imports. So it's critically important that we actually get a system in place that will protect the public. The Food Safety Enhancement Act, which is before the House of Representatives, addresses this issue head on. It requires FDA to consider both the food safety and the environmental impacts when promulgating regulations for food production. It requires the standards to take into account small scale and diversified farming, wildlife habitat, conservation practices, watershed protection, and organic production methods. This is all in the legislation that's before the House. This provides an appropriate focus on public safety. It gives the farmers and consumers both an opportunity to weigh in these, on these standards, which we don't have today with the AMS standards. And it would protect the sustainable and organic farming communities that we all value. These are the type of standards that consumers cannot live without. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. By the way, just an update, the bill that was voted on did not receive the required two-thirds, so it will end up going back for some work and yes. some of the concerns that were expressed by members who voted against it is that they were concerned about the effect of the bill on small farmers and organic farmers. So yes. I think that um, the center, which endorsed the bill, uh, needs to take heed of the concerns that are expressed. And I think if, if, it, if, we, do, if we do that, perhaps when the bill comes back out to the floor, we can see it uh, pass. Uh, thank you. Well, that means uh, we'll have five minutes, each of us, for questions. Uh, hold on a minute. So, Three stores sums to the highway trust fund. This is a fifteen.
Well, that, that really does mean we should move this along. I, I just want to um, thank Ms. Cobb. How are you feeling, by the way? Um, I'm fine now. How uh, many years ago was this? It was May 2008. And do you, have you felt any um, after effects other than no. the fact that you're not really keen on eating certain no, yeah, products? Yeah, other than at home. No, there's no... I am at a higher risk of cardiovascular disease later in life and um, urinal type issues, urinary tract. Um, but as of right now, I've had none of that since that same summer. We're glad you're here. Thank and you. I, I think people need to, to, there needs to be a public face of somebody who's dealt with this and you've dealt with it. And takes a lot of courage to come before a congressional committee to relate your experience, so we appreciate that you're here. Thank you, I appreciate it. The other thing I want to I note is uh, um, when Mr. Horsfall began his statement, um, I, I was impressed that you said that Ms. Cobb's testimony doesn't fall on deaf ears. That was a real, you know, what I saw as a uh, unrehearsed response to hearing what you had to say. And I just want you to know I appreciate that because sometimes we get uh, people come in here with a story that can be very difficult and the individuals who may have some responsibility generally in that area seem to be impassive about it and you've showed that some concern and I think that's, uh, uh, that speaks well. I, I'd, like to, I'd like you to address the uh, concern about some of Calma's metrics. Uh, and the arbitrariness of them. Your, your auditor must find that the adjacent land to a field of green must be free from compost operations within 400 feet of the crop edge. What well, only requires that the adjacent land free from uh, grazing to so the land's uh, domestic animals within 30 feet of the crop edge. What's the justification for allowing domestic animals, the uh, uh, animal waste products of which are a component of compost, to be closer to the crop edge than a compost operation. The uh, the, the LGMA program is, in, in, you know, the, the metrics are based entirely on risk assessments, um, and, and 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 I think that's in keeping with FDA guidance and and. Well, you know, well in, in a, I know, I'm I'm getting to it. Pardon me. In a, um, the, go ahead. The 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 compost operations are considered to be a very high risk situation in terms of pathogens. We also have you know, significant buffer zones if there's a confined animal feeding operation where you have a large number of animals of risk in, in a field. That also requires... So remember, you've got domestic animals feet. closer domestic to the animals crop edge and, than and the compost be, operation. Because the, 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 the risk assessment tells us that there's a lower risk involved if you've got a, 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 a couple well, of animals on a farm. Let's look at the 2006 spinach incident. Isn't it true that the field identified as the source of a contaminated spinach was less than a couple hundred feet from where domestic animals grazed and shaded themselves? Uh, I don't know that for sure, but I, well, let's I'll check it out, okay, it. and I, see if we can maybe I can we check could look on at that. Sure. Maybe we could come to some kind of a conclusion if there's any contradiction. Or isn't it true that Calma's auditors? would not today find any problem with growing spinach intended for the ready-to-eat market growing a couple hundred feet from the land where cattle grazed, exactly the conditions present in the 2006 spinach incident? Uh, I, it would depend on the number of cattle that were there, uh, and, and I don't have those numbers in front of me, but uh, uh, in that particular case, the, uh, the final report, as I recall, you know, the, 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 should, the feces that was found that had the, the same fingerprint was over a mile away. Should, should Camel be tougher on the processors who make the bag lettuce than it currently is? I think processors, uh, if I could address that, processors are under the jurisdiction of FDA. They what are about Camel? They are already I mean, should, inspected. You know, we're looking at possible, possible nationalization of this. Should Cal, should uh, Calma be tougher on these processors? You've heard testimony here. What do you think? Did you say did, should cattlemen? Should, 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 should CALGMA be tougher on the processors? Oh, Cal I'm sorry, I'm not used to that. Who make the, the, ba the bag lettuce, and it currently is. I think that processors need to be regulated just as heavily as growers do, uh, and that regulation, I believe, is in place okay. for FDA. Appreciate that. Um, I just want to do one more question here. Um, uh, Mr. Koch, you're the father of the spring mix. Spring mix helped 
pre-cut packaged leafy greens become a vegetable consumers like and eat in increasing portions, significant health contribution, but you're also a critic of the ready to eat leafy green industry. In your opinion, is there a way for the American public to get the convenience and health benefits of pre-cut packaged vegetables without the harm to farmers you mentioned in your testimony? Yeah, just a point of clarification, uh, developed the concept of spring mix, uh, never put it in bags and it was never ready to eat. It was a field run product. It was uh, washed, cooled and packed, dried and packed into uh, three pound boxes. But it wasn't, uh, you know, I always had serious reservations about how that product was displayed and I didn't ever want to go into uh, and what, what would be the long-term results, uh, Mr. Koch, uh, in your opinion, uh, on the environment if CALGMA is nationalized in its current form? In its current form, uh, it, I think it will affect too many growers of uh, lettuce and cabbage and kale and chard, the things that are traditionally harvested as whole heads or, or bunched items because they don't make a differentiation between it. Um, those things haven't had any outbreaks associated with them. People, uh, they often have a kill step associated because people um, heat them up before they eat. They steam them or boil them or roast I've got some uh, follow, thank you. I have some follow-up questions to uh, Ms. Uh, smith DeWall. We're going to put them in writing. Okay. And I'm going to go now to Mr. Jordan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief as well um, since we have a vote pending. Let me, too, thank Ms. Cobb for, uh, for being here. And um, how, are your, how are the little ones doing? They're doing fine? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, they're, Matthew doesn't remember he was too young. Liberty still remembers, and we'll talk about when I got sick from a salad. She knows what it was from. For a while, she would tell people not to be afraid of a blood machine because she remembers coming in while I was having a transfusion done. But overall, they're doing, they're doing well. Well, let me, let me also thank your family for their service to, uh, to our country. Thank you thank all you. For, uh, for, for being uh, with us. Now, let me just get a couple of basics. Where, where, where's your home state, Mrs. Cobb? Uh, my home state is Washington. Okay. Um, it, Mr. Uh, Horsfall, the, the program is um, completely voluntary. Is that right? The, the 120 yes. people who represent 99 percent of the volume, I'm looking at the, I think this came off your website for LGMA. Um, 120 handlers, 99 percent of the volume of California leafy greens. That they're all voluntary. Those 120 who joined. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is uh, what's the what's the assessment? How's that determined again? We assess our members based on the volume that they ship. It's a penny and a half per 24 count equivalent box. And I just want to be clear: are are big producers part of it, or are these are the people who? We're, in other our, words, are the farmers part of the organization, or is it just the folks who take the farm product and then package it? Our members are handlers. Uh, they are the people who put product into commerce. The are majority some of, the handlers, of them, are some of the majority handlers, of them are growers as well. They're, they're both. Yeah. So some are both. Some of them actually produce the product and handle Absolutely. it. Absolutely. So right from from the field right to their operation, it could be around the same premises. Mm -hmm. And they sell to each other. Pardon? And they sell to each other as well in the okay. industry quite a okay. bit. Okay. And since um, since you've come into existence, which was 06, 07, what year? 07. Ha have there been uh, any? any outbreaks of, of E. coli or any, any problems? There have been outbreaks um, that have been reported. I don't know that, I don't believe the health authorities have conclusively finished their investigations yet to say where product got contaminated, but the, there was a small outbreak in Washington State uh, that Ms. Cobb was affected by. Uh, last year there was an outbreak in Michigan. So can you definitively say that we've seen an improvement um, in that there have been less problems since your organization has been formed, or is that anyone's guess? Um, I, the answer is yes. Fewer people have gotten sick tied to lettuce and leafy greens in the last two years than, mm -hmm. say, in the two or three years before that. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, I, I, I don't take that as a metric. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think we still, if anybody's getting sick, then we still have to figure out how to make the program better. Okay. Um, and that's where the research comes in. Again, okay, now, Mr. Koch, um, are you a, um, you're a uh, farmer and a, and a handler? I mean, you, are you part of this organization, your, your farm, your operation? I'm, I'm not. Um, we, I have, there's two different entities. One is a um, sales shipping cooling company. The other is a farming company. The farming company contracts with a um, handler that is signatory to that, and we grow some crops you know, cilantro, dill, and parsley, mm -hmm. in this case, for inclusion in a salad. 
um, that they want to be grown under those metrics. Mm -hmm. um, so we do that part. Otherwise, uh, we have a diverse crop mix. Uh, there are only a few things that are, would be considered leafy greens. Um, and I've, uh, I've resisted uh, because I think it's, you know, the principle is wrong of this agreement. And so I, I didn't want to. It's cost me uh, the ability to sell into Canada because they won't accept product, even though, you know, we're organic and we test mm -hmm. soil and water. And, they won't accept product that's not, um, if you're not signatory to the leafy green marketing agreement. Uh, I, I don't know, I'm, you know, I'd prefer not to go there, you know, have to. I was hoping that something would, you know, become a little more logical, so you, yeah. you know, focus on the process. I, guess, I mean, just as, a, just as a, you know, a country boy from Western Ohio who, um, you know, didn't, didn't grow up on a farm, but we live out in the middle of my wife's family's farm. It, it seems to me that the, the problem is, you know, you, you think about whether you're it, the product is grown close to composting site, whatever. I mean, I remember when they used to spread manure on the field. I mean, so it's just like, it seems to me the problem has to be after the product's taken out of the field. I mean, that's just common sense. Uh, yeah. Maybe I'm, no, maybe I I'm just a country boy missing right. something. And, and the product has got issues. The, the slide that you showed about the uh, bagged, you know, it's a, I mean, it's a great concept to give people something that's ready to eat, but it's, it's a perfect incubator. I mean, how do you keep that, if you, if you can't, Sterilize it. How do, you know if you've got any little pathogen and you you break the cold chain? I mean, even a customer just taking it out to their car and then driving home. You're, it's potentially it's a it's a difficult issue. To, mm -hmm. I mean, a product to get to market. Yeah, yeah. Safely, I think. We we have to vote. Thank you all for coming. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Jordan. I want to thank the witnesses for being here. I'm Dennis Kucinich, Chairman of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee. Ranking member, our hearing today has been ready to eat or not, examining the impact of leafy greens marketing agreements. We've had two panels. Uh, the testimony has been very important. We appreciate your participation. This committee stands adjourned. Thank you. Next, Representative John Conyers of Michigan talks about health care legislation and Justice Department investigations at the National Press Club. His remarks are about 45 minutes.